Amen.
transmission died over Christmas, and I took it down to the Honda to have it fixed, but it can't be fixed for a reasonable price. So I'm having a salvage yard. Thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, today is January 23rd, 2023. This is the Aspen City Council work session. Uh, we have one item on our agenda this evening, which is the Community Development Work Plan Project Definitions and Priorities. Hi. Greetings, uh, how Mayor are you? and Council. Uh, I'm Philip Sapino. I'm the Community Development Director. I'm joined by Bonnie Muhigirwa. She's the Chief Building Official. And Ben Anderson, uh, the Deputy Director, will be with us momentarily. Um, Unless there's any preliminary questions, I'd like to share a brief presentation. Go right ahead. Thank you. Okay. Uh, periodically, the Community Development Department works with City Council to develop what we call a work plan. Uh, for any given year. This helps us prioritize uh, the work that we're going to be doing on behalf of City Council and the community, um, both at this table and in our offices downstairs here in City Hall. Um, it's our hope tonight um, to introduce you to some of the topics, reintroduce you to some of the topics um, that you have brought up to us in the last, I'd say, 12 to 18 months um, that, that staff believe uh, warrants some additional work, policy work, code amendment work. Um, as well as describe to you some of the internal initiatives that we're going to be conducting in 2023 and beyond, either in response to uh, sort of our ongoing operations downstairs or process improvements, things of that nature, th things that we engage in on a regular basis in our administrative capacity. Discuss specifically um, the projects, again, that we heard from you about that we believe warrant additional attention in this year, uh, and then come to some agreement about next steps um, broadly for our department, as well as specifically um, for those individual projects which you desire for us to engage in. Um, specifically, we want to talk about the project list. We'd like to put some definition around what 
council believes those projects entail. Um, the majority of these projects we haven't discussed in detail at the council table, excuse me, not the majority, but some of the new projects we haven't really discussed in detail at the council table. Staff has done some preliminary work to conceptualize what we think council meant, but we want to hear more specifically from you about those um, specific projects and topics. Um, and then to assign some prioritization to those, again, included in your memo uh, was staff's sort of conception of what the priorities could be relative to staff resources, the council calendar, and the amount of time and effort required for the different projects. But some additional discussion I think would be helpful around that. Um, and then that will help us arrive at whether or not additional resources would be need, needed um, to uh, continue those projects. Um, there were four specific questions included in your memo. Those are shown on the screen now. These are, of course, not to limit your thinking or discussion around these topics, but these are the things that staff is most interested in making sure that we hear from you about this evening on all of these topics. Um, rather than saving questions for the end, it would be very helpful for us to get questions and engage in some of this dialogue on each individual project to the extent that it's appropriate for each project. There are some projects included in the memo which staff is pretty far down the road on, and we believe we need less direction from council in terms of scope or budget requirements or timing, et cetera. There are others that are just in their infancy, and getting through all these questions and more is gonna be very helpful for us. So again, please don't save your questions for the end. Let's just get into it um, on each individual project. Uh, as I mentioned off the top, um, in addition to the policy and code work that we uh, believe will be engaged in for the next 12 plus months, there are several internal and administrative projects that staff is working on in conjunction with other referral agencies, other city departments, and within community development and environmental health which uh, are significant undertakings in their own right. Um, in no particular order, but um, uh, just to run through the list quickly, the fee study and update, this has been ongoing for some time and is being managed by the finance department, but involves every development review agency at the city. The building code, which we hope you will adopt tomorrow night, uh, requires implementation. Uh, we have to actually take the legislation and turn it into a new Title VIII help our customers and the community understand what that means and then go about training ourselves on what that means. Um, permit process improvement, this is something we engage in every year. Um, we're always trying to create and implement a sort of culture of constant improvement downstairs in how we do business. 2023 is gonna be no different and we've identified some changes we hope to make in the permit process soon, as well as work with the city manager's office to identify our longer term set of strategies for how we can make sure we're serving, serving customer needs as efficiently as possible. Um, Salesforce, this is our uh, permitting process uh, software. And again, it's used by all the referral agencies. It requires constant maintenance. Uh, we have some staff engaged in that on a regular basis. We'll be working with the city manager's office on community demographics analysis as well as other um, policy initiatives as they come up. The short-term rental program, which was adopted as part of Ordinance 9 last summer, um, we've gone through the sort of first iteration of permit renewal and new permit issuance, but the development of that program continues to take a significant amount of staff time. Um, and then in parallel to that, the commercial core and lodging program manager will engage in commercial core services, uh, the sort of development of that program in 2023 as well. And then we're staffing um, up the planning division again after some significant turnover, uh, and we continue to work to integrate environmental health and sustainability with building and planning to make sure that our services and our policy work are as responsive to community and council needs as possible. So again, not even a comprehensive list, uh, but it is extensive and things that we're working on every day in addition to the things outlined in more detail in your memo. I'm happy to answer any sort of preliminary questions about these before we get into the policy and code work. Questions at this time, Skippy? Yeah, so you want questions about these things now? <clears throat> Please, yes. Okay, uh, so I have a number of them. Um, sort of the, the permit process updates, how do we envision that happening? Like what does that look like? Who's involved, et cetera? Uh, well, so um, 
typically the building permit process, which is sort of an administrative function of the building department and the planning department, as well as our referral agencies, so engineering, utilities, parks, um, we're always talking to each other, identifying opportunities for greater efficiency, for a new sort of communication channels, things like that. Um, and as I suggested, I'm working with the city manager's office to develop a bit of a roadmap um, for how we want to work together to continue to make those improvements. Um, we've conceived of a 30, 90, and 180 day sort of plan uh, for 2023 to identify internally and implement internally um, some of the changes. I outlined what I believe are the 30 day metrics, or some, excuse me, the 30 day items in your memo. Um, more work needs to be done to put the meat on the bones of that plan. Um, but again, it's this function sort of baked into the chief building officials' day-to-day -day operations, um, as well as the deputy uh, community development director, uh, his sort of day-to-day -day workflow. It's always sort of churning in the background uh, okay. in a, alongside all these other initiatives. Are we anticipating going out to, whether it's developers or whomever, like elements of the community who do this work to talk through possible process? Yeah, on a, on, a, on, a, on a targeted basis, yes. Okay. Um, I wouldn't describe it as being the same as the outreach we would do for a code amendment insofar as we're going broadly to the entire right. community and sort of casting a wide net and, and, and asking bigger picture questions. But we, um, prior to the onset of the pandemic, we ran a stakeholder advisory group that met quarterly, and we would meet with them, use their expertise, and sort of bounce ideas off of them. For, I think, obvious reasons, the pandemic um, put, a, put a stop to that, and we haven't picked it up again. Uh, okay. But that's something that, as long as a, excuse me, in, in addition to a more robust sort of public communications effort generally to sort of get our narrative out there a little bit and seek input on, th on things of community interest are definitely top of mind for us this year. Okay. I just ask, I, you know, like over the number of years I've been up here, I've heard a number of kind of good ideas from the community. And I don't, I don't intuit that this is one of those things where having sort of 200 people at limelight with dots is going to be at all helpful. But I think, <laughs> I think, you know, certainly like going to key players in the development community and saying, hey, these are our goals, right? We want to only have projects that meet our underlying values. We want them to move forward as quickly as possible, not sit dormant um, and, you know, comply with all these things. Like what, what ideas would you have to do that? I think that stuff could be super, super helpful. I Absolutely. Heard some good stuff. Okay. So I wanted to make sure that that was in there. Um, and then on the STR stuff, the further development, what's the scope of that? Like, what do you think would or wouldn't be included in improvements? Um, well, I, I don't want to suggest that we've, we're in a position to know how to improve or not. We just did something kind of for the first time. Yeah. Um, I know that our program manager has been sort of keeping a running list of things that require, I think, additional assessment about how they went the first time. Topics like how we're communicating with and informing our customers and whether we're using the right tools to do that communication. Um, looking at our permitting software to make sure that that's the right tool for managing the system that we wait in, in the way that we want it managed. Got it. Um, so I think it's a little premature for me to sort of telegraph what that work looks like, other than to say we're building a significant, robust program, and that requires sort of constant assessment and tweaking, and we're going to be doing that all Got year. it. It's more just like we know the dust is settling, it's new, and just figuring that out as we go. Correct. Yeah. Okay, that's, that's fine. Um, and then on the demographics, I thought that was interesting and a curiosity of mine, but... Like, what are we looking at, and do we have a particular reason for looking at that now? I think broadly what we're looking at is in response to some council comments and community comments over the last couple of years about the degree to which the pandemic uh, brought on a demographic shift in our community, both within our city limits and then a little bit more broadly in the county, mm -hmm. and looking at how that's actually playing out in terms of census data and um, maybe some of the socioeconomic profile of our residents and understanding then how that translates into how best the city organization can engage with our residents, seek input from and inform <coughs> our residents about matters of community concern. And Sarah, if you want to jump in, please. Uh, sure. Uh, in addition to the census review of the census data, uh, we want to take a look at voter data um, because we think the voter uh, the core voter groups of this community have changed quite a bit over the last 10 years. 
Um, and we think that's an important piece in understanding uh, placement of any future ballot issues, that this is sort of foundational work we need to have done and ready uh, for you to understand in those decisions in future years. So we like at, at the Northwest COG is kind of talking about potentially picking up like the mountain migration study and doing a second one. Would this sort of be like our, our check on those things, like how much of that stuff was sticky and not? I, maybe not directly. Okay. Uh, you know, for example, one of the things we debated was to check uh, whether we should be using a data set about uh, real estate transactions in mm -hmm. part of our analysis here. In this first phase, we're going to hold off on it and see what we call from the, the, the other data sets first, um, and, whereas what you're talking about sort of plays more into that secondary piece. Um, and, and namely, it has to be is keeping this scope manageable to start with and learning from it to help inform what would be further study. Uh, but we think this again foundational data it lets us check into assumptions that were made in previous years previous decades even um, to see if those still are in alignment in public policy decisions in the future got it uh, yeah just there are a number of bullet points or nine bullet points anymore it's on I might have one more Nine bullet points I see here, and I don't see that they can all be separated as, as unrelated issues, and I see how some of these are gonna blend into each other. So I, I, I'm not sure how to um, prioritize where there's some overlapping, but to give a um, overview of what I think are most important. But yeah, they're one, it's hand in glove on some of these. Absolutely, we agree. Do okay, one more. Go ahead. Can you just kind of give the the Cliff's notes for the Commercial Core Service Program development? I don't know if I missed that in the packet, but so we uh, we used to have a downtown services manager, this is Mitch Ozier, and uh, Mitch left the organization, and um, I worked closely with Sarah, who um, helped us restaff that position, and so the, the the Commercial Core and Lodging Program Manager position is split between running the short-term rental program and re-engaging in downtown services. Um, there's a significant sort of communications and uh, sort of public engagement component to that job, making sure that the business community has a direct channel into communicating with city government, as well as um, regulatory education and enforcement, the degree to which different agencies, uh, regulations, might play out in the commercial core, be it about solid waste or signage and lighting and things like that, making sure that we have somebody downtown who's visible, who can be that conduit between the business community and their and their and their direct government. line of contact, support and education for the business community. That's sort of correct. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, cool. No, that's it. And, and that's Emmy Garrigus, right? That is Emmy Garrigus. <clears throat> that's great. Thank goodness. I would just add on to that, that also includes CCLC responsibilities. Thank you, Sarah, yes. yeah. um, so coordination with Saturday Market, um, lots of those things. Um, and we know Emmy, you know, this is Emmy's one person. The job is more than one person with both STRs and downtown and CCLC. And so we're, we're doing analysis on the STR program development to figure out what do we need to actually ask for to administer the program? How does that fit in with the assumptions we gave you um, when fees were based, uh, were set, uh, that's all analysis work that we, we couldn't, we, we could model for you, but now that we're living it, we'll have real data to come back to you and say, ah, we think it takes one additional administrative role right. or half of an administrative role. We just don't know right now. Um, but we think, you know, by, by the time we come around to fall budget, we should have a pretty good handle on what that, that ongoing maintenance staff level should be for the STR program to give Emmy the time to do the downtown work. So Emmy will be the halftime person for this. Okay. That's great. She's been, I mean, I get to deal with her as a non-council person on STR stuff, and she's just awesome, like so responsive, and I've heard it from a ton of others too. So I feel like that's the that approach will be really welcomed by businesses downtown. That's great feedback to yeah. hear. I think she's doing so an excellent job. Awesome. Yeah, and I've heard that from a lot of people. Thank you. Yeah. Did you have any items at this time? My comment is going to relate more to the broader memo and the question that you ask about uh, capacity and supplemental support, whether it's for uh, additional position in the longer term or uh, consultants. 
And I just look at um, the magnitude of all the work and know that it is unending. There always will be other projects, other council questions, other things our community members bring to us to deal with. So, uh, you know, I can see where there is important work to go on with all of these. I think um, the STR program um, is off on a very good foot and a good start, but there's always a few things that you don't uh, see right off the bat. And one of the ones I'm hearing about the most is um, the living situation when people are in a duplex and one side of the duplex is an STR and the other side is not. And if anything really is changing the nature of your immediate residential neighborhood through those walls, uh, that's one I think we really should do a further dive on at some point. Um, the thing that's not on our list that is there a little bit uh, in the background of some of these things, which we've discussed before at the table, and that is to begin to talk about outdoor propane gas heaters and uh, gas lighting, because we're now seeing just a traction light all around the place. And I'm like, wait a second, we're spending all this money over here to electrify things to deal with emissions, and over here we're just blowing emissions uh, straight up. You know, we're a ski area, we're a res resort, snow economy, and I think we need to deal with that question sooner than later. Thank you for bringing that specific topic up. And, uh, you know, the memo is brief and, and the topics are broad. Staff, staff has envisioned that specific topic as being part of the commercial vitality conversation. Okay. I, I kind of thought so. Our, I just in our conception. To, yes. to, to make sure that was part of that. Um, and I, I just don't know and I don't want to delay the rest of the conversation here about what, what were the discussion topics on uh, the credits program that we really don't have the capacity to be digging into now, um, you know, I, I think some of those issues are really important to broader character, particularly <clears throat> on-site, off-site issues and things mm -hmm. like that. So um, that's where I come back to capacity and, and making sure we're not asking too much out of the team. I'd rather do uh, the, uh, the right number of things the right way than too many things uh, halfway. And, uh, but capacity, I think, is, is what our community demands from us in terms of timeliness. So, thank you. Barring any other questions, I think I'll, I'll move forward. Yeah, I just want to know when you want um, other input specifically on the questions that you have or any other. Unless there's anything specific about the internal administrative projects, we'll get into greater detail on, on the actual uh, meat of the memo as, as, we, as we continue to move forward. Okay. Um, again, we sort of covered the uh, permit process. I should have hovered, hovered here. I apologize. Um, so Ben is going to walk us through credits and outdoor lighting and, um, um, excuse me, um, the miscellaneous code amendments as well. So, Council, um, this is a topic that we discussed with you on December 12th at a work session um, around some potential improvements to the age credits program. Council gave very helpful direction at that time. Um, we're working with Design Workshop um, on this topic. And I think in that list of, of things that you showed some interest in, I think that there's, there's two categories of things. One is some things that we can do pretty quickly. There's simple, simple code changes. They do have some policy questions related to them around, say, how we perceive the RO topic and, and that kind of thing once we get to a, some proposed changes. But I, we do think that with the work that we've done to date um, and with kind of breaking those topics around uh, affordable housing credits into a couple different categories, I think that there is um, you know, staff capacity and, and work to this point that in quarter one and quarter two of this year, we could come forward with some code amendments related to the credits program about the kinds of units um, that credits might be eligible for, um, the types of the types of units, um, you know, whether they're RO or, or different categories that are that are currently allowed, um, you know, things like should we have dorms or or co-housing projects be eligible for credits, those kinds of topics. I think we can come, um, you know, before the summer um, hits us, but. There's some other things on that list that are really impactful that I, I do think are longer term conversations, um, like the city getting involved in, um, you know, the credits market, either guaranteeing value of, of credits or, or purchasing credits and, and, and 
um, getting involved in that way. That's a, a larger conversation that has, you know, impacts ac across um, different agencies in the city. And so those, I think, are that, there's kind of that second category, I think, that are longer, um, longer uh, time frames. Um, but with council support this evening, um, this is something that we could be to you with, a, with some code amendments um, in the first half of this year. I don't know if anyone has any questions going back to that, that December 12th work session, but that's where, uh, where um, staff is on this topic. Rachel? Yeah, um, I, I guess I'm not entirely sure what from the December 12th work session is not gonna make it into the work because at least for me, this question of whether projects can develop a significant portion of their needed affordable housing on site yeah. versus uh, only buying development credits further out in the community, it, it, it's critical. It's a, it's a critical question. Um, you know, at some point we'll, we'll move them all out, you know, somewhere way far away because the land in town is too valuable to house the actual workers. And um, I just can't see that. And uh, it, it's, we've created a program that uh, enables growth and encourages growth is the way I see the AH credit program in some ways. And if, if people didn't think, oh, I can build this and have another 60 employees, I'll just go buy a credit project somewhere that someone's gonna build, as opposed to putting some of their units on site or developing a smaller project because there's just not those credits available. I, I, I'm worried we've become a growth generator through, through this as opposed to having the business owners and businesses uh, solve their own housing problem in some ways. I'm, I'm totally okay with housing program going forward, but not when all the businesses can take all the housing off site and put it somewhere else. And it just creates commuting problems. It creates all sorts of other problems. And I, 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 so I don't like seeing this pushed to off. I, I, think I mean, I, if you were telling me you can bring that code now and you'll start working on the other bigger issues and questions for this community in the second half, that would be one thing. But uh, again, the AH housing credit program has become the growth generator that allows people to, to dream big and assume that their housing credit, and, and you, as a ComDev, you've come back to us literally saying, we don't have enough housing credit programs for the people who are developing now. And it's like, well, why aren't they putting it on site? You know, there's just not always this escape valve. Well, I, th thank you for those comments. And I do think it's, it's a complicated set of topics. I do think that when we look at the credits program, there's a supply. Um, issue of the, the projects that are being um, developed to produce credits. And then there's the demand side of the equation, which I think is more so what you're getting at. And I do think it's a, it's a fairly significant policy conversation that needs to happen because for decades, there's been choice given to developers about how they're providing their mitigation. Um, and for a long time, whether it be buy down units or developing a project, um, sort of outside of your subdivision, your new subdivision to sort of meet your affordable housing needs. I mean, those are, those are tactics that I think have been built in on the demand side of the, the, uh, the equation for sort of mitigation requirements for a very long time. And so I, I do think that that's, you know, a fundamental question. I think from Comdes perspective, um, over time, I think it's given developers perspective, you know, given developers flexibility about how they wanted to provide their mitigation. And, um, you know, I, I will say that in the, in the stuff that we talked about on the 12th, while I, I, I'm not discounting the importance of that, the stuff that we were talking about on the 12th was really about the supply side, about the development of new projects and encouraging those new projects to produce affordable housing units that can then be used to mitigate by, by developers. So I, I, just to be square, these things are really focused on the supply side of that equation, not on the demand side of that equation. And if council desires to have that conversation, um, we can certainly do so, but it's, um, that would be, I, I think, a, a significant change to how the, the community has looked at, um, you know, how development can provide their mitigation requirements, um, you know, going back a long time. Yeah, you know, Ben, I, I, I do totally respect what you're saying, and the only thing is I don't want to create all solutions on the supply side without addressing the demand side. I mean, that, that, that would be out of balance as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Yeah, you, I, I don't think we can 
really separate the two because uh, well, when when new developments come before council, uh, that's where we can make a, a decision, a policy decision now that uh, a certain percentage have to be on site. But all of the all the developments are in the pipeline now that have approvals have uh, it, th that cake is is baked. Yeah. So we need to change the ingredients before we do others. So the policy on uh, where this workforce housing mitigation is is created is a policy decision that I'm I'm interested in. But it, w once it's approved, it's it's too late to make a change on it. And I I you can't separate the two. You know, development does feed the need and the demand for uh, work for our workforce housing credits. Mm -hmm. um, I, if we can work to create that supply with private developers, that's that's important. But you know, when you're you're severing off a, a portion of a, um, a FTE for mitigation, and there are no affordable housing credits, th then you have to go for the fee and lieu, and we don't want. We, yeah. we want to try to avoid that. Yeah, and I understand that. I guess one of the other concerns I've had, and I, I think it was discussed at the 12th, I don't know where it is in this memo, but um, the dynamic that's occurring now is larger employers buying the credits and then only renting to employees and creating um, a, a difficult system to track might be the issue of, uh, you know, are, are those employees being held down on the rent because they have a place to live? Are they getting the same treatment as others? And for me, watching the credit program evolve, it was a lot of people buying their units and getting keys and creating permanent community members. And now it's turned more into um, a leasing program and more inerrant uh, work. And I, I, I'm concerned about that. I always thought the housing credit program was about creating some permanent community members, and it is becoming just a rental program. And 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 it seems that only our larger employers and perhaps out-of-state corporations are the ones able to buy these credits, as opposed to a small business that's on a three or five-year lease. And so, I, I'm concerned. We're what are we creating with the credit program? And I'll leave it at that. I'll just chime in here, and this is a topic you and I, I have had some back and forth on over the years, is that uh, public-private partnership of a, of a public developer supplies workforce housing. I believe they should have some kind of a priority on housing the people subject to APSHA guidelines. Uh, and um, that's a policy discussion we have to have, whether people can have a right of first use for 30 or 60 days, and then it goes into the regular pool. But if somebody builds units, they, I, I think it's reasonable to expect that they can give a priority to the employees that they're, they're housing if they work for the company. Um, so it, it's not something to go into in depth here, but something that uh, as we get into these discussions this year that I, I want to try to put some kind of uh, uh, definition to enclosure on. Thank you. If I, oh, please. Jump in first. Well, I was, I was a just, lot. just in, just, <laughs> I think there's, there's some really um, big and complicated topics that the council has, has just uh, landed on. And I, I guess from council's perspective, we can bring forward to you any kind of information that, that you'd like to hear from us and have any kind of conversations that you'd like. But I think in response to this, um, is there a majority of council that would like to see a policy resolution from, from staff in the very near term? to look at some of these targeted improvements to the credits program, or do, is there a consensus that we need to um, have a larger policy discussion before that policy resolution comes forward? Well, just to jump in, because <laughs> this is all very interconnected and very complicated. Um, Rachel, I understand your point about wanting to have more units closer to town. I'm, like we're, I think we're all like a thousand percent there with you, and I understand your concern about the increasing control, let's call it, of, of employers over potentially employees or certainly properties, and the potential negative downside or even abuse of that. I think that's that's fair. Um, 
the the good side of that is like we I think for years we've said how do we get employers more involved in affordable housing and they've demonstrated with their dollars now that they're willing to do it and so is there an opening to try to figure out a better way for them to intervene without sort of putting off work that might be helpful and the this is where it gets really complicated because I also think the other thing we're talking about which is I mean all affordable housing over forever, so far as I can tell, has been growth in some way, right? Either something got developed and so we made them mitigate so the growth was there, or we got money from the RAT uh, or sales tax, but then we went and built something and so there was growth there, right? And so the, the one thing that's in the like maybe list, I think looking into the development neutral stuff is really we should raise that because I think we are at the point where we're completely built out and we don't want to be approaching it this way anymore. And interestingly, the credits program, if better developed, could be an avenue for that. So it could go from the negative to the positive if we make fi financial contributions in different ways. Um, and I hear from developers all the time who are building, you know, the large spec homes and that, that if the math worked, yeah. you know, our investors don't care, we'd prefer to do this. And so I know that's all big and interconnected, but I could see it being part of the solution. You, you know, again, I'll, I'll let this go for a few of their work. I can understand how, how complicated these things are. Uh, but I, I think it's important that there become more transparency in the credit market. You know, you, right now the credit market is only going towards new growth and new development, yeah. whereas there's a lot of existing businesses that don't have access to knowing when there's credits available to buy or how to buy just one. Uh, you know, how, how can we help our small or existing growth or existing businesses that need um, access to, to bid on these units or to bid on the, the credits? But right now, it's really all about going towards new growth. And I'd love to see some way in which there's more transparency when these were coming on the market so that other people would know they have a chance to bid on them or make an offer to the developer or something. But uh, uh, it'd be just nice. To, to, just to clarify, are you talking about affordable housing units that were created for credits, or are you talking about the purchase of certificates of affordable housing, which is the piece of paper that has monetary value? I, I'm talking about being able to get into the market. To, how, how Employers cannot buy APSHA units. Can they buy housing credits? And even if it's a mitigation credit, maybe they sell the mitigation to somebody else, but they want to get their employees in there. How, how do we make the housing credit work for existing businesses as much as for new development okay. is my question. I think I think what you're talking about is like the project on Main Street, right? The blue and gray one that got built for credits. They sold the credits, but then when they went to go sell those affordable housing units, they sold them to employers for more than you would have a cap for who then rent them out. That's what you're talking about, right? Well, I, I'm just talking about how do we, we open it up so that the housing credit is not just facilitating new growth right. and that it's helping to deal with the existing shortfalls that existing businesses, maybe some businesses that never had to mitigate, mm -hmm. have some access to. I mean, what I'm hearing is a, a few different points that are all interrelated that I think could go into this this year is like, yeah. yeah. So, so this is really important discussion. This is precisely the kind of discussion we, that next we want to be having. And my question is, does a majority of council, to, and not to sort of reiterate what Ben's saying, does a majority of council want us to move forward with this sort of targeted, more narrow set of amendments, which, if I can summarize, would only sort of seek to improve the existing system? Right. Or does a majority of council want to have a larger conversation about the relationship between the affordable housing credits program, how we mitigate for affordable housing from commercial and residential development, and how that translates into access to units and the different issues that, that we've heard in the last in the last 20 minutes or so. I mean, I think because we I, want to. I would suggest that my answer would be yes. I'd like you to bring forward a res policy resolution to deal with the simpler program improvements to what we have now, and that we put it on the work plan to have a much larger conversation Understood. about where is this policy taking us and it, couldn't it be improved to, to create broader community benefits? Yeah. And it, it doesn't have to be one or the other, it's more about sequencing. And, and I think that the things that I picked up on from Rachel there, which I would agree with, are in that 
broader discussion, right? I mean, kind of baked into this is just how do we get more housing units where we're not doing the work? But the other things are transparency. What is the role for, you know, employers in this and the broader housing system? And how do we deliver housing without additional growth or development? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we're kind of, uh, that there should be kind of a morphing of uh, housing credits program and uh, public-private partnerships and creating workforce mm -hmm. housing, uh, like the the um, what Aspen Housing Partners, the three developments mm -hmm. uh, where they house employees without uh, generating growth. Whereas, the, as you point out, that the uh, housing credits program of its own, the, the only way that they get used is by growth for mitigation. So. I, I, and I question Ben coming back to your question about should we have, and this is the way I'm visualizing it, should we have specific uh, codes or rules or should we have a wider policy discussion and make those rules fit into the policy discussion and it seems to me that we should have a wider policy discussion so we don't uh, box ourselves in when we've uh, created some smaller policies or codes or um, that to fit an individual situation. Can I ask a follow-up on that? Which is just like from our work session, I think we had a handful of things we were pretty clear on. So is it the case that that stuff is kind of sitting there ready to go? It's not like we're gonna go do the work and then erase it and then start over? Yeah, I think that's that's where staff is right now. It's, yeah. one, it's one of the reasons why this is up front is that we feel like we've we've done some some work based on that direction on the 12th. Um, we've got those topics identified and sooner than later we could bring some of those things forward. And again, you know, some of the big conversations about how it might impact, you know, if we were to go after the 150 fund and, and try to use dollars from there in support of the credits program, which has been suggested, you know, that's a lot more work. Some of these other things, um, again, are mostly around types of units. Wh who, like, you know, there's a discussion about private-public partnerships. Like right now, those those kinds of arrangements are precluded um, from pursuing credits, and we're trying to, you know, come up with some access to those kinds of, of projects. Yeah. Um, and in certain circumstances. Um, nonprofit agencies, et cetera. And right. so we got pretty clear direction about from that on the 12th. Those are the kinds of things that we were thinking about here. Okay. And I will just suggest in response to your, to your question, just from what I'm hearing at the table this evening, there is a chance that if we have a large discussion about relationship between the credits program and access to units and, um, you, you know, how we, how we mitigate for affordable housing demand from, commercial development and residential development, there's a chance that that work may end up being unnecessary. And so that's why we're asking the question about prioritization. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I think you've heard support here for kind of two track on this item. Yes. Uh, support for what you've brought forward and continuing on the work that you have already scoped out, but that there is a desire for a longer term conversation not in Q1 or two. Understood. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. All right. Um, before we leave this topic, I wanted to ask a quick question, uh, and I support that direction myself. Um, uh, and I hate to talk specifics, but I got a question here. One of the pictures that's on your slide presentation here is Park and Park. Mm -hmm. Looks great. Um, <clears throat> you know, I, 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 it's been so long. <laughs> that it's hard for me to remember the details. But, you know, the way this is presented, Park and Park was brought forward as a, an affordable housing development opportunity that was going to create credits. Correct. The original iteration was a local Either credits means. developer was going to redevelop the property and create credits. Without getting into too much detail, um, do we do we know and we I mean we have people in the audience that might yeah. might have some information or not but but what was the stop on this why didn't it go forward is it related to the credits market my understanding is that the project was purchased by another local developer and that local developer did not um, either amend the approvals or submit for a building permit prior to the vesting expiring. So the three year vesting period expired. Um, and so now there is no approval for a credits project at that property and its future is to be determined by the current owner. Okay. Um, 
Oh, okay. I, I understand. It, we, it, we did talk about that, like in the thing about, you know, vesting and like, how do we not let that happen next time? Yeah. And I'm not so concerned about that. I'm just looking at this just from the lens of the credit program. Yeah. If the incentive was really there and the, 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 then this would have gone forward, it would have been changing hands. The certificates would have been changing hands, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but there's uh, extenuating circumstances. So that's plenty on that. Thank you so much. Is there any more on the AH credits? Not from staff. Let's go to the next topic then. Um, this is again a topic that council has shown some interest in related to the application process for the demolition allotments. Um, again, uh, through a, a settlement agreement and, and a resolution by this body, um, 2022 and 2023 um, de uh, demolition allotments have been issued uh, to the original applicants. Um, but you gave us very clear direction to improve that process and give some clarity to that process so we don't repeat um, what we you know, ran into on August 8th when we opened up the process. So again, this is something um, that we have been thinking about, ready to work on. Um, it really doesn't need to go into effect until um, January of 2024 when those, that next round of development allotments would, would be uh, available to the public, but it's something that we're working on. And again, don't need any further direction from council, but just wanted to make sure it's something that you wanted to, wanted us to, to keep on our, on our work plan. I definitely want to clean it up and make it work better. Um, are we thinking something minor, like you just can't access the submit page until the time of? Are we thinking more major, like moving to a lottery system? Um, I know what our legal counsel would like to see us do. Okay. Um, and so I, I think it's, it's going to be a lottery system. But I, we haven't, to be honest with you, I, I think going back, we haven't used these allotments in the way that they were designed and the way that they used to be used, where there really was a true competition. And so um, it is a bit of a learning process for staff in that, you know, what is going to be the right mechanism to make sure that we don't repeat what happened on August 8th? And, you know, I think a lottery or some version of that is, is going to be um, what we ultimately design and, and propose. But the logistics of that and the specifics of that, I, I think, are t to be determined. Okay. And, and we have also heard comments from specific council members who desire a, a different system than a lottery. And so we scoped this conversation to begin in the second quarter of this year so that we can have time to ask council the question, make sure that we get majority direction on their preferred, on your preferred method before we go about working with legal um, to develop a, um, some, some, some kind of response. You know. And the wheel is for illustrative purposes only. That's not, a, that's not an actual proposal. <laughs> well, Ward and then John. Yeah, I, I, I think there's general agreement that um, the first round didn't go as well as we had hoped for. And I would like to see that uh, final approval on what the uh, next allotments, how they're allocated to be approved by council so uh, ComDev is insulated and that the responsibility lies here at the table for the, the, the method that is used. Yeah, fair enough. John? Yeah, I just want to say that uh, apparently the lottery is is the only way to keep people from gaming the system. So I fully support with whatever you guys come up with. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, comments for me here, you know, I put uh, the demo permit and uh, waste diversion in the same kind of category. My hope is that, um, you know, our demo allotment permitting process is reflective of that. Our value that goes into there, our values as in our beliefs, is, is it truly about deconstruction, reuse, and diversion. So I'm really hoping that um, that can be one of the lenses that you, you're looking through when you're looking to make clean up on this. Um, can you unpack that a little bit? Or, or sure. So, you know, for me, uh, let's say that there are 10 properties, 10 residential properties that are seeking a demo permit. Um, to me, they are different. If there is one property that is saying, you know, we are 4,000 square feet, but we're going to take 60% of this and get it to reuse, um, that to me deserves more consideration for a demolition permit than does a 4,000 square foot property that says we 
are not going to pursue that avenue and we will pay whatever landfill and tipping fees are necessary. So, so I'm, I'm hoping that um, somewhere these can marry our demolition permit process as well as our, our goal of, of diversion. And, and if that plays into some sort of prioritized or lottery system, that's great. I just um, hope that it's, it's reflective of the values that we want in it. Um, that's all. Just to, just to follow up with a little more clarity, so th this is akin to a bit of the ownership APSHA system where there's certain entry criteria that will earn you more entries. And so that's something that we certainly can contemplate oh, what that criteria may be for the council to say, here, the, these type of get you extra or bonus entries because you're helping meet other community goals with your project. So rather than duration of work history, it could be environmental. Right. Reviews. There's a variety of things you may choose. Is it all electric? Is it all like there's lots of ways you could you could approach that. Interesting. That's cool. Thanks. Sarah. So just to clarify, Tori, are, are you suggesting um, that there be a, a point system of of as um, Sarah suggests that uh, the scope of the demolition and the waste diversion uh, would be a matrix uh, to decide on uh, demos? It, it, it could be. I, I can't really say that right now, um, having not really looked into it to, to really see what the machinations are there. Again, I'm just looking for our to incentivize, um, you know, that uh, responsible behavior that we're trying to get. So I don't know how you get there or what that looks like, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I, su I support some kind of a point system that would be based on scope and diversion and reuse and uh, environmental impact. And I don't know that we can tie a demolition to what the project that's replacing is going to be, but um, I'm, I'm sensitive to I your... You can't, yeah. Thanks. I think that makes sense to you guys. It does. Just, all right, thank you for that. Uh, yep, we can move on to the next one. And then one of the other topics that there's been significant work done, we're working with Clanton Associates out of the front range um, in an update to our outdoor lighting code. Um, we're getting pretty close. Um, Clanton delivered us a, probably a 75% complete draft um, that's in staff review right now. Um, as soon as we get that to 90%, which should be in the next few weeks, um, we intend to sort of launch into uh, sort of a public outreach campaign to anybody who's interested in looking. Sometimes some, some people are more interested in outdoor lighting than others, um, but certainly we'll, we'll be working with CCLC and ACRA um, and kind of technical stakeholders in our design community to make sure that we're on the right path. Um, but again, in the first half of this year, we can, we can easily be to you with um, the ordinance process to adopt those code changes. Um, and I guess one of the questions I do have for you is, is um, ahead of that sort of presentation of the ordinance, we have had previous work sessions on outdoor lighting with council, but it's been a while. And ahead of that ordinance process, would you be interested if, you know, this is something you want us to continue to prioritize, which I, I hope that it is because we're getting pretty You're close. close. <laughs> um, don't uh, turn the lights off. <laughs> yeah, don't, don't turn the lights off on this. Um, would you like a work session to, to go through the details of this prior to the ordinance process? Well, I'm, I, I think we've had this discussion in work sessions in the past that this is all tied to our dark skies and how um, I suppose we do need some kind of a check-in, but I want there to be a good tie to the dark skies. I think there's a couple paths we could we could engage in. One is we could kind of set forward a, like an info-only memo, kind of giving direction about where we went in the, in the ordinance, uh, in the proposed ordinance. But we'd be happy to find a date for a work session prior to coming to you um, at ordinance if, if you want to have a, have a conversation about the details of, of the lighting code. Find out more. Yeah. You know, uh, as Ward said, we have discussed this a few different times. Um, I'm wondering whether maybe having a more detailed first reading uh, uh, presentation would be sufficient. Um, along with an information memo, if you'd like, but that way the public gets it and the public doesn't necessarily see our information memos and we don't have to have an extra work session. Yeah, I, I think a, a robust first reading can work. I, I just, you know, it's a lighting code. I want to see a lot of visuals, and I think people will understand that better than reading a big packet. Personal Picadillo, I really hope that part of the result of this is not 
two blocks of beautifully warm lit Christmas trees and then one stark white 7K tree. How did that happen? So bad. <laughs> so On bad. Main Street. <laughs> um, That's all I see. Uh, sounds like not necessarily a work session, um, but it does sound like there's uh, additional interest from council members, so a thorough first reading could, could get it done. Um, I agree with that sentiment that's here. Uh, in you know some almost 20 years off and on at some seat here, uh, the lighting code comes up occasionally um, and it is a non-issue for a lot of people and then it is a, of extreme importance to some. Mm -hmm. um, and so I do think it's great that we'll have a thorough review of it, that's for sure. And I would even, uh, I know that this is somewhere that I'm, I think you have worked closely with designers and builders so I would love to as it comes forward see some of their input and make sure that, that we're aware of any of that certainly yeah that'd be great periodically the community development department needs to fix things in the land use code um, these are different than sort of bigger policy regulatory objective type conversations. There are, the land use code is, is 400 some odd pages, which has been developed um, in a very sort of bespoke manner over about 50 years in this community. And as a result, sometimes there's bad citations. Sometimes there's strange language that's, chose, that's sort of written in that actually in retrospect doesn't make a ton of sense. Uh, sometimes we change some things in one place and it actually gives us an opportunity to fix something in another. Um, and so uh, periodically we try and clean things up and we haven't done that for some time. And uh, staff has identified a, a, a raft of cleanups, non-policy related sort of administrative and enforcement focused cleanups. Um, nothing that would change the fundamental development rights or processes to, uh, um, that are baked into the land use code, but nonetheless would represent significant improvements for our customers and for our staff. Uh, and so we would like to prioritize this in 2023 and um, start working with council in the second half of the year to bring this forward. And again, because of the nature of the amendments, uh, this does not require significant public engagement um, because they're sort of technical in nature, ministerial in nature, if you will. Um, and we believe it can be conducted fairly efficiently and in concert with some of the other initiatives that we're, that we're outlining for you. Ward first. Yeah, and, you know, Philip, as you mentioned, this, these are some things that have gone on for 40, 50 years. And I would like to see um, these code amendments put into context by stating what those community values that have been identified over the decades are. We've done that with um, the Newcastle Creek Bridge and uh, that whole process of 10 values. We did it at uh, the Aspen Institute for the Upper Valley Mobility to make value-based uh, decisions, but to, to, to identify what those values are that uh, these code amendments might be um, um, based on and, and the context of it. So we, we have that scaffold of what our values are and what we're basing these on. Understood, thank you. I support the cleanups. Just a Absolutely. comment slash question that may or may not guide thinking in any way, but I just I, I definitely support this. I, I'm wondering, you know, if we have in the past or if we have any thought to like kind of a meta rule setting around this, right? I mean, it, it, it's sort of in all human organizations, whether it's like your house, a business, government, whatever, the onion tends to grow even when we go back and do those. And so, you know, I think about like, when an individual wants to work on their like wardrobe and not acquiring new things. Just having the, I don't want to do this and I'm going to review once a year tends to not yield the result, but when you like one in, one out is going to be a rule. Or if I don't wear it for six months, then it goes in this thing is a rule. Or if someone else is going to get more joy out of it, whatever. Like there's just some pre-negotiated rules that can sort of help steer us with preset negotiation in the direction we want. I'm just wondering if we think about it in that way at all. Well, I think it could be great to just give growth management to another community. Yeah. I'd would be, would be all about that. Be like, here, we're not, we're not getting joy from this. Murray <laughs> <laughs> um, Kondo says, to veil with you. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 will, I will say, um, Skippy, that uh, the way that we think about this is that there's Scrivener's errors that we can not have to go through any process with. And they're just, they're typos or, you know, something that 
a detail that we didn't catch when, when we were making connections between codes. But what these things are, are things that were sort of unintentional outcomes of this kind of layer cake of, of, of the code over the years where we tweaked something over here and it made something over here go away that we didn't intend for it to go away. Um, those are the kinds of things in terms of the, the nature of these things. Because I, I do think that anything beyond that um, that starts touches on touching on policy questions, we got to have a fully different process with. Yeah. These really are beyond Scrivener's errors, but not to policy questions. Yeah. That's really the assessment of what we include in this yeah. and not. That makes sense. And it, there is a there is a practice in in most other communities in this country of maybe every what ten years, fifteen years, they just write a new code. And this community has never done that. And I want to be on record saying that this community has never done that. And I'm not advocating for it because there's a bunch of compelling reasons why that would be almost an impossible task um, in, in this community, in our political context, in our development context. Um, but I would just note that is an approach that other communities take, is they just unpack the whole thing and keep what they like and get rid of what they don't and start over. So interesting. It's like, when do you not redo the house because it's a beautiful mid-century modern and you want to preserve the history? And when do you not do it because it's become a hoarder storage unit and you're just too scared to start? <laughs> 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 okay, so we're going to approve the code cleanups. Great. Yeah. Yes. Understood. Very good. Okay. <laughs> um, so that's the the list of, of, of sort of existing initiatives. Um, the, the next two items are new council initiated projects and these come out of the last year's worth of discussion with council about a set of interrelated topics. Um, we talked about some of it during moratorium work. We talked about some of it during um, work around the affordable housing amendments that we were doing prior to the moratorium. Some of it came out of individual or collective council comments in response to land use cases that came before you. And so staff has, we diligently take notes when we're up here and uh, we review those notes and we've distilled out uh, those comments into what we believe are a couple of areas of inquiry that council is particularly interested in. The first one is uh, our boards and commissions, our land use boards and commissions, specifically Planning and Zoning Commission and the Historic Preservation Commission. Um, from staff's perspective, uh, we have observed uh, an increasing trend towards, uh, uh, towards challenges attracting and retaining members on both of these boards. Um, part of, there's an adjacent issue with, with, with how we staff uh, different types of meeting formats. So this, this, this question of digital, hybrid, and in-person meetings, that has actually created some significant uh, uh, angst amongst board members about how, how we meet, how, they, how we do our business with our land use boards. Um, additionally, I'd say in parallel, there's been discussion at the council table about the composition of those boards, the jurisdiction of each of those boards, where their jurisdictional boundaries are, um, and the, the, the processes associated with how those boards review projects, what they're reviewing, how they review it. And I want to be very clear, I have not heard, Ben has not heard, specific comments about zoning standards or development rights or the historic preservation guidelines or the, or the commercial development guidelines specifically, which are the documents that these boards and commissions use to conduct their business. The sort of questions and comments that we've heard and that we're attempting to respond to are very much focused on the boards themselves um, in, this, in this proposed project. Uh, the process as staff has envisioned of it at, 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 um, at this point, and again, without council input on the broader topic yet, is that um, first and foremost, we need to conduct some best practices and some background research. We're not the only jurisdiction with a PNZ and with, with an HPC, and so let's learn from some of our peers about how they uh, structure and staff and populate uh, and then support the work of those boards and commissions. Um, after conducting that work, we feel confident that we can come back and have an informed policy discussion, give you some examples about how other places do things, and hear from you um, about what are those issues that you're most interested in learning more about, what are those interested, or excuse me, what are those issues you're most interested in trying to solve for 
in this particular line of inquiry. And then once we get that direction, uh, we would then uh, work closely with the boards and commissions to hear from them about pain points and ideas for improvement or um, different sort of topics that we should be exploring as staff. And then finally, we would begin the formal code amendment process to the extent that we would be directed to do so. We would begin a formal code amendment process, including stakeholder and community engagement and council work to arrive at, at um, potential land use code amendments around how these boards um, function and how they're and how they're structured. So again, that's like 60,000 feet level, uh, and we are looking for a specific feedback about again the scope, the process, the timing, your level of support for 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 what we just described and what was described in your memo. Rachel. Well, I would note that you have this uh, beginning in the third quarter of 2022, or 2023, excuse me. So um, a lot of it would matter as to how well the other work has been wrapped up in the first and second quarter, I think. But uh, to me, we're trying to uh, improve the delivery from all of our systems, and our boards and commissions are part of all those systems. And so if we're looking, um, whether it's length of time for a permit or length of time for review for change orders that come in to an existing permit. Um, these all things work because of the different um, mechanisms we set up. I think we need to look to streamline, improve, and support the board members um, in uh, both clarifying and simplifying their roles. So I'm all okay with this work. Thank you. Yeah, I think this is kind of in line with Rachel saying is that uh, if we wait to third quarter to get into the specifics, specifics of this, I think that's missing an opportunity. I, I, from a number, see how we can approach this. Um, of re recently, there's been a, a lot of community concern about vacant uh, commercial properties. And I've heard from a number of different sources that uh, there seems to be, and this is something that I think could be handled administratively, that there seems to be a roadblock when it comes to, uh, has been particularly mentioned to me, HPC, and that I, I want to make sure that um, there's there no um, there's no delay because of who is submitting, uh, that everybody is treated equally, that um, HPC doesn't become the place where people where uh, uh, permits come to get stalled uh, that um, and, and we've heard along with the hybrid meetings and the the um, confusion between what uh, board members feel and what staff feels and what um, has been characterized as uh, city council wouldn't fund something and on another side that is too complicated that uh, the, the relationship between staff and board members needs to be smoothed over and that um, if we get to third quarter and start looking at some of these other policies, but from, from at least the administrative side, if we can focus on uh, there not being roadblocks uh, in the way and not being roadblocks specifically for individual applicants and that everybody's treated um, timely and uh, fairly, that's... Uh, uh, then when we come to quarter three and start looking at this in more detail, uh, but I definitely feel that this is an area where we need to do some work, and I don't want to see um, um, delays characterized blaming one party when um, generally there um, there's plenty of uh, blame to go around from both sides of uh, application. So. Um, I want everybody to be treated equally. I don't want there to be roadblocks, and I think that's something that can be handled administratively until we get to Q3. Skippy? I guess I'm a little confused. Um, uh, what Ward was just describing, I thought was what we were kind of talking about in the process and systems improvements at the beginning of this work session. Are we thinking that the boards and commissions review is for that, it's to move the process along for development faster or more fairly? That was not in our in our necessarily immediate intentions with this. Uh, what we continue to see is is that there's been questions about this composition and jurisdiction in the review processes um, in a way of uh, can that process be better according to review processes including meeting standards, um, all of those things that are that 
those appointed members must conduct their meetings by as a commission on your behalf. Um, so I, I would say eventually it will get to that level, but I think there's some foundational things that need to happen first around um, how, how does this council or the, the future council wish to have those review processes look like at that policy discussion before we can get answered this question. Okay, all right. I, 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 I disagree. I think that if there, if there are um, cultural behaviors that can be changed before we get to those policies, that they should be, they should be addressed. Um, so I guess there's, there's more in this than I initially thought. I initially thought. I, um, I, I feel like the conversation has been sort of muddied a little bit. Okay. So I, I just want to reiterate staff's conception of what this particular project is, as distinct from the permitting process. And Councilmember Hammonstein, to your point about sort of equal treatment and how staff engages with applicants, we endeavor to treat every single one of our applicants equally and fairly, and we do that to the best of our ability every single day. And if you're getting feedback that's not commensurate with that, I'd love to have that conversation in a different setting. But this particular project, to us, is about how we populate these boards, what their review authority is comprised of, which is different than how the Community Development Department reviews permits. Right. The HPC, for example, reviews development applications for compliance with guidelines uh, and with you know, compliance with zoning standards, for example. Staff in the building department is reviewing that same application for compliance with the building code. So we're talking about a very long, very complex, multi-step process. This is about how the boards that begin that process in the land use review sort of part at the beginning of, of, of a development entitlement process, how they are able to do their business and yeah. what they're being asked to look at when they're doing that business. It. It's very, that's, and that's different than, again, the administrative permit process that we discussed at the beginning of the meeting. Well, I mean, if, if kind of what Sarah was describing, which is just the sort of general functioning of the meeting needs to be improved, I think that's fine. That's like a, that's a base need that we mm -hmm. should definitely do. I'm, I'm, I was coming in a little concerned on this one that we kind of have gotten into PNZ and HPC in particular because we haven't liked outcomes. And if we haven't liked outcomes, like that's a zoning and standards issue. Like to me, that's not a board and commission issue. And if we want to change things, we should do that. But I don't think that's here. Um, the broader one that's not just HPC or HPC though, that, that's a real problem is, I mean, I don't want to characterize it as apathy, but like people are just not showing up, right? And, and I think that's happening across all boards more and more and sort of all city integrative functions here and everywhere else in the world. And that's a real problem to solve. Um, you know, whether that needs to be, you know, put ahead of other work around housing this year or not, you know, I do question that a bit. Um, but I do think it's really important. And I, I recognize that answering those questions and like going out to the community and not just talking to members, but the people who didn't opt in, you know, not just why didn't you, but what would get your fire up to, to be involved in something is important. And it does have very significant downstream effects around trust and inclusion and all the things that make everything we do here work. So I recognize the value, but I kind of question how much and when. If, if I could respond a little bit, I, I do think that there's more significance to what's being proposed here. So I think we, we started and it, it got into some other things, but I do think, and I'll give you an example. Um, when we did the moratorium work, we moved um, a review of affordable housing projects that were compliant with the land use code to an administrative process. Right. So that is an example right. of how within the land use code, those um, choices about review processes, about bodies having jurisdiction over one topic or the next, um, while I think they're distinct from the permitting process, they're next to each other, mm -hmm. right, in terms of how projects move through our overall development uh, review process. So it's not just about composition and how meetings take place. It does, I mean, what's, what's being proposed and the things that we've heard from council over the last few years, um, we're, we're proposing evaluating and then making a proposition okay. around some changes to review processes and jurisdiction as well. Um, what power does, does HPC have? What power does PNZ have? How does that relate to the reviews that city council does and doesn't do? Um, and I, I do think, you know, in terms of the timing of this, for, for, you know, for us, 
getting this lay of the land of what other communities are doing is, is very important. And with direction from council, we could start that best practices and background re research with consultant support that we don't need any ad additional budget authority, that we have dollars within ComDev's, um, uh, within ComDev's uh, um, current budget authority and, and, and allocation to kind of start that work and to see what are some best practices elsewhere, what are some, what are some, um, how other communities structure these relationships with the kind of development context that, you know, that may be similar or not to Aspen. Okay, yeah, I mean, I guess I, I, it, it makes sense, and certainly if there's other communities that are getting five out of five stars on Yelp every day, like we should, we should find out. Um, but I think we're gonna have to be ready to move in both directions, right? It can't just be I mean, maybe it can, right? But it, it very well might not be that just getting everyone in line with what we used to do is gonna work. It could be that the way we've done it is why people are opting out, right? And we also need to go meet people where they wanna be. That's the idea. Okay. Um, you know, I have a couple comments here, but n nothing that's not kind of reflected on the screen. And the reason I look at you, Skippy, is because you were talking a, a little bit about the, the goal <clears throat> behind this. Um, and, you know, for me, I mean, I, I look at bullet points, member attraction, retention, composition, jurisdiction, uh, you know, just, just the difficulty we're having with boards, as you were pointing out. And so I, I'm supportive of, of taking a fresh look at this. I appreciate how Rachel was characterizing it as well as, as such an important part of what we do that it only makes sense to um, just take another look at it. I really appreciate starting off with best practices and background research. That's going to be helpful for me. Um, I haven't worked with PNZs and HPCs in other communities, so it'd be great to learn what we can. Any other comments on this topic? John? Just that I fully support it as well, and I, I think member attraction and retention is something we all need to work on. Thank you. Thank you. The, we saved the best for last year. Um, ben and I have been discussing terminology uh, for the last couple of weeks. It, I use the term commercial vitality because I've, I'm sort of reheating it from previous uh, council initiatives around some of these topics. And I think Ben's point about whether or not it's, it's really um, illustrative of what council seems to want to get at is a good one. Um, so I think it's commercial vitality for now, but, but th that is meant to be a, a sort of big category, a big, a, big, a big bucket in which a lot of different topics are being, are being sort of included. Um, over the last year plus, we've had conversations, be they about a specific land use request, all the way to a, the conversation around climate change and propane heaters. Um, all these topics have come up at the council table, um, I think, in several different ways. Uh, but outdoor commercial activity, in staff's view, includes things like outdoor dining on private property, on sidewalks, on different forms of right away, like the malls, for example. Uh, but it also might include things like outdoor commercial displays. Um, but is it's different from some of our uh, sort of very specific regulatory uh, elements like advertising and community character. So sandwich board signs and lighting and amplified sound and sure, things of that sandwich. nature. Um, we've also talked extensively about temporary uses and structures. There's a tie-in to outdoor dining. There's also a tie-in <coughs> to uh, special events. There's also a tie-in to um, commercial retail activity. So, so that's, that's a, a sort of big and important and uh, complex topic. Talked about advertising and character a little bit, but but broadly things like signage are some of the stickiest and most frequent topics that come up in sort of planning world in in most other communities in the country. And then we've also heard from council specifically about business regulations, formula businesses, vacant storefronts, things of that nature. And then I think adjacent to that is what I'm calling construction management policies. That gets into some of the discussion we've had both recently and in the not too distant past about um, unfinished construction projects. So that is again, a huge set of categories that all relate to the look and feel of our commercial areas. Um, and staff, at least in, in, in our view, sees sufficient tie-in between these topics to feel like at least at the beginning, we need to 
be having this broad discussion around around character and around social and economic outcomes in our in our uh, commercial core in order to arrive at a sort of policy discussion that might refine the list a little bit and give us the direction that we need. Um, it's so big, I used two slides, right? I mean, it's not, not, yeah. not, not, not even done yet, uh, but, but happy to take a question. Uh, um, oh, no, no, I, th I thought you were, were done on the okay. slide, so go ahead. Um, and so again, conceptually proposed process would, would be first to define a scope with council. Um, and we believe that, that after some council sort of scope discussion, some initial stakeholder engagement would be helpful. This is before actually getting into a code amendment process. But if, if, if council can provide staff with some direction about the, the broad topics you're interested in our exploring and how you see the relationship between things like outdoor dining, outdoor heating, our commercial core, commercial vitality, and the environment. That's just one topic that has sort of four different tendrils that we'd like some, some additional clarity around. We can then take that to CCLC. We can take it to the Planning and Zoning and Historic Preservation Commissions. We can take it to business owners and, and, and residents and hear from them a little bit about, about, hey, about how they define those issues. And then we believe we can take some of that input and, and, and help council have an informed policy discussion and potentially arrive at a formal land use code amendment process. Um, w given the list of things you've been presented with this evening, um, relative to the size of this particular topic, set of topics, um, we don't believe that, 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 that we ought to or could begin this work until the third quarter or later, and this would extend well into 2024. Mm -hmm. Ben, do you got any additions? No, I, I do think that depending on the, the scoping exercise with council and the community, um, this could be a doozy of a project. And, and will. I, I would will suggest be. this would rise to council goal level, yeah. the, the scope and time commitment necessary right now in this initial blush um, is absolutely that level of resources and focus required um, to have a meaningful outcome. Thank you. That's absolutely agree. Rachel? Yeah. If you could just go back to that last slide, Philip. Um, I uh, agree with what Sarah has just told us about the scope and um, the involvement that uh, these discussions would take. And I agree with that entirely. I just think that the very last bullet point, construction management policies, could drop off of that list of commercial vitality and should be managed as a separate topic. Um, I think it's a little more straightforward than any of the others. And um, I, you, you've heard me discuss it at the table before as well as others. But it, I think we need to make sure we have the right set of incentives and disincentives to finish your project in a timely fashion. Maybe some disincentives from, for change orders that are significant, which we've seen be a big part of the delay of some of these projects where they uh, get approvals for one thing and come back in and want to change it to something entirely different. And then it needs to go back through three or four different review boards. And then they still have to respond to the changes that those review boards ask for. And I, I want to see what we can do to, uh, again, create the right series of incentives and disincentives. Um, I've talked about projects needing to have a completion deadline when they come in, or a range of deadline. And then the parking that they're uh, paying for could be uh, a tool for us to use when they're using the construction parking in the public right-of-way um, to say, okay, if you finished on time or before time, you'll get a refund of some of your parking. And if you don't, your parking will, will double to finish this. I mean, that's only one tool. But what? how do we separate out our processes uh, for development approvals and the state processes so that we can look to perhaps eliminate some of the, the loopholes, I would call them, that people use to keep a permit alive, even though they're really not intending on, on finishing the construction any anytime soon or not diligently. And uh, it just strikes me that all these other things are very complex. They're, they're about uh, formula retail or outdoor advertising and all these things, but construction management is different than all those things. Those things are about dealing with what is already there or could be allowed in the future or should be modified. Construction management policies are totally different, and I, I think those should be two different topics, and I think construction management policies should be the first one that is dealt with. Understood. Thank you. Thanks. Good comments. Appreciate that. 
Um, I agree. I agree that that probably doesn't fit as well on that list as maybe handled on a, a different list or its own. Yeah. But you said to do that first, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think that's what our community is calling for. And um, one, one last comment, because I've heard a number of people say, Aspen's built out. That's all built out. It's like, no, we've entered the brownfield stage when everything is already a brownfield and will be redeveloped. And they're going to be coming in for redevelopment of every building that hasn't been redeveloped yet. I mean, we're, we're nowhere near built out. You know, when you look at the FAR that's available to a lot of these other spaces and just the, what we're seeing with rebuilding of existing buildings already. So we're, we're gonna see uh, uh, construction management policies being critical to actually the survival of the vitality of the core as these many projects will come in. Bogies. Yeah, I mean, you're just seeing a lot of, a lot of older landlords selling their properties and, and that makes sense. But I just, I, I just see these as, as, as uh, more critical to what the community is, and our guests are experiencing now than perhaps some of the other topics. Yeah, I, I definitely interested in finding ways to um, keep building permits, move, or the construction moving along and what we can do uh, from a government standpoint to encourage or discourage uh, one way or the other. Because I think the goal is all the same, that we want these projects, once they're approved, we want them to be built in a timely manner. And we've seen time and time again where a little bit is made and then a change and, and, and everything just keeps going and going and going. And we hear from one side, well, you know, it hurts me when I can't lease this because I have a lease for it, but then they change, uh, a, a change order comes in and like you say, it, it just it cycles right back through. through the cycle. So anything that we can do from a, a maybe it's not a construction management or a development process or um, some way to legally um, keep these <coughs> projects moving along. Yeah, I, I don't agree with this per se, but we did receive an email as this meeting had started with someone suggesting that whatever businesses are closed, if they're closed more than a certain period of time, they have to pay the sales tax that used to be generated by that city. You know, and I, I, I don't think that, you know, these are the right approaches, but when you close seven or eight restaurants in town in the same winter and uh, evacuate the tenants and then nothing happens on the construction, we all notice it. And when you have big holes in the middle of uh, the Galena um, Cooper Street Mall uh, for God knows how long, we all notice it. And, um, you know, I, I understand that uh, the developer can have challenges with their financing as interest rates change or getting the right construction crew or whatever, but to the extent, and, and you put your finger on it, Ward, in the development process or in the permitting and approval process is where we might be able to have more control or set further expectations for when this project will advance. And, and I think that that's very important. One second. Um, I hope Skippy or John will chime in on kind of the same thread because mm -hmm. um, there's a suggestion here, number one, about this moving, but also it getting some attention. Um, but we need more information from these guys about what attention it's already getting and where it falls in because um, there's a lot under just construction management policies for the commercial core. That's a broad topic. Um, so John and then Skippy. Yeah, I was just going to say I fully support this. I think the goal, obviously, is to avoid what our downtown is going through currently with boarded up buildings at either end and a big hole in the middle. <laughs> so thanks for your support on trying to close these loopholes and, and uh, make sure this doesn't happen again. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I can agree with pulling off that bottom bullet. That's another one that I kind of saw as part of that process and systems reform, so to speak. You know, once we know this is the thing we want, how do we deliver it as efficiently as possible? And I think this is really a thing where, like, our interest and the community interest and the developer interest are all very much aligned. And so there's just some, some unintended friction in the process that's gumming that up that we can resolve. So I think doing that first is great. And I do think it's, it, is, it is intricately... Uh, 
if, if, and for me, like when I think about coming back at first reading in Q3, like triple highlights over affordability and accessibility, right? Like, well, what can we do to make that happen is kind of really what I think of as the top line goals. And a big part of why things are affordable is how long and how much money it took to create them and how much they have to make back, right? So I think they're very, they're very linked. Um, so yeah, I'm in agreement there. Um, and then I think, you know, mentioning going out for conversations prior to coming to us, um, I think, you know, two really important interest groups to, to speak with. Um, the first is, you know, the business owners that we consider already delivering the sort of last of the affordable, accessible local business, um, to talk to them and, and to really have that conversation to be about, you know, what could we do to support? What incentives could we have to make sure that you know you don't also go the way of all the others who came before? Uh, but what can we learn to apply to others in a fair way? But to drive the conversation so it doesn't become protectionism either, right? Because those groups can often be what stand in the way of you know more opportunity for community. And so, how do we just make it fair enough to like get them on board, support them in a way that we can do other things as well? Um, and then two from the accessibility piece, you know, I would love to just check in with. You know, the, the large, I mean, I'm kind of, I conclude myself in part of this. Um, part of our community that's been lucky enough to find a job and a way to live here and, and all that, but like can no longer really interact with the commercial business sector in any way. Who can't afford to go to restaurants, who doesn't have a bar to hang out with someone who, and like what would they really want? You know, where would they want it? How would they want it? How would they want it to feel so that we can bring our resources to that, which I think primarily is space, whether that's, you know, right of way, walking mall, armory, streets, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, work with the business community to deliver that. Um, and then the last thing I would ask us to just think about is sort of the ongoing operation management. I, I see that as a piece that should like not at all be in the city or city council thing, like whatever we're creating. I don't think we should be up here choosing businesses or whatever. Um, so just to start thinking about, you know, what would like a board of directors look like of the best, you know, entrepreneurs or retired CEOs or whomever in the community who has a particular eye for business that we could start to brainstorm, you know, what would the best sort of, you know, oversight and selection look like oversight and selection of if we're going to be you know whether it's you know the armory or it's you know, the use of city right-of-way or streets or walking mall for new affordable business you know how do we determine who gets to go there you know what are the standards what are the criteria all that sort of stuff you know I think it would be smart of us to leverage the you know, probably like the highest concentration of successful business people who are retired or maybe even still working here as, as part of that structure, as opposed to having all the businesses come pitch at city council. I'll let them think about how to approach yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other comments on this commercial vitality piece? Um, I, I just wanna, I wanna, uh, I wanna just add good news in this because we've heard a lot about this from our community members and you know I really feel like uh, we're getting to the other side you know we've had uh, some uh, we had a lot of development planning going on in the downtown core it got stacked up there's half a dozen plus projects going on downtown we're gonna get through this you know, I'm glad that we are looking at ways to improve our process and our system, um, but I'm also uh, very excited that that we are moving through this this one period. I am hopeful that we don't see this kind of situation as Ward was painting earlier in our downtown core um, as a regularity. But I and and that's why I have hope that this is just an anomaly and that we're working through this particular time and. Aspen's history. Next topic. I just want to clarify then there, the, that with with the removal of construction management policies, council is generally supportive of, of, of having an extensive process around these very large topics. And moving the construction management Correct. policies and potential permitting improvements that could go along with that management forward. Yeah. In um, a different bucket. 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Great. To both slides. Okay. Um, so next steps, Ben's going to do a lot of work. Um, of we will work with city manager's office to uh, build this into a calendar based upon council input and the various other city projects that are that will be presented to you in 2023. Um, that will include identifying scopes of work and potential resource needs and using either the spring supplemental or the fall budget process as necessary um, to secure any financial resources and bring consultants online. Um, again, credits and lighting, first half of this year. Um, and we believe that uh, with your support, we can do really good work in 2023 and beyond on these important topics. Um, so if there aren't anything, if, if there wasn't anything else that wasn't covered by staff and council discussion this evening, um, that's a wrap. Thank you. So council members, uh, just an opportunity for any final thoughts and comments. Skippy, did you want to start? Oh, well, I mean, I'll just start. I think we have, a once again, an ambitious list. Um, I think, you know, having the, the business affordability in there is exciting. That's one of those things that I think we've all kind of talked around from different perspectives forever, so to really get that going is, is really awesome. Um, the only other thing I, I wanted to just bring up, um, and we had the, like, not quite making it on the list list. And, um, you know, I wanted to have the conversation about um, non-development options. And it sounds like we'll be doing that in a limited scope within the credits area, how we can do this without growth. Um, so I just wanted to kind of double click on that um, and recognize that we're not going to be taking that further out or broader. I, I, I wouldn't make that assumption. We have direction from council to to do otherwise. Uh, I'm assuming you've seen to, to the, the non-development affordable housing component. Is that the limit of the scope of your comment? Say again. Non-development uh, housing. Affordable housing. Is, is, the is that the scope of your, of your comment? comment? Yeah, 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 I just want to make sure, okay, because that, that wasn't explicit, so I didn't want to make, make sure I misunderstood you. Um, we, we have council direction okay. uh, uh, on that matter, and um, th those aren't matters for public session. Okay. I'll, I'll just say that all four of the questions on page eight um, kind of tie in together and uh, putting them in the larger scope. Um, I think what I'm looking for is a, a development process that is as smooth as possible, as fair as possible, as uh, streamlined as possible, that their expectations, their goals, their timelines, uh, their, um, there's a policy that it is uh, fair and equitable to, to all parties, and I do support Sub, um, entertaining supplemental budget requests to uh, do for more staffing or uh, consultants or whatever is needed to achieve the the um, priorities that you've outlined in this memo. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ditto. John. Yeah, I just wanted to thank staff once again for all the hard work you went through last year during the moratorium and the STR issues we had uh, that was above and beyond. Our community thanks you. And we at this table thank you. Thanks for that, John. For fear of asking the wrong question, somewhere in there we need confirmation that we didn't miss one of the major things council was expecting on this list. So we, we do request that today before you close out the meeting, Mr. Mayor. Items that are missed? Right, are there eight major items that are missed? Okay. Right, you have some other code amendments you've asked us to do this year that are under development right now, which will move forward, such as around organics diversion and so on. Those will continue. But if there's new topics that you think are significant, we, we would like to make sure we have um, understanding that those are perhaps still on a list somewhere, even if they're not getting programmed in 2023 um, from, from the table. An example for me is construction and demolition debris that affects this department. I thought that was a separate conversation we just had. <laughs> but, but So it should be on but, this list too? But the, 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 it's the timing of it, the timing yeah. of that work, right? So what we're saying here is, is that we are going to prioritize these new things over anything else you give us in 2023 unless you come back and you change, you know, only so much room on the plate, unless you're going to take one of these off mid-time during the year. Um, so it stays within the budget authority and staffing resources we have. And it's always better, in my opinion, to try to get something done, mm -hmm. work through the hard work and get it done, rather than trying to do many things at once. 
um, that slows them all down. That's why I bring it up that we're just looking for confirmation. If there's other little things hanging out there, we don't want to feel like we didn't understand that when we leave tonight. Thank you. Um, well, as you bring up construction and demolition debris, I, again, from our last work session, I thought we were still working on that, or maybe I just got the wrong impression from our joint meeting with the county. Um, th is that something that we need to add to this list now? I mean... Uh, we, we do not have direction to create a construction and demolition waste diversion program right now. We've had direction specifically on organics, and we've repeatedly said this is your, an area where you can have a major impact, but there is not direction yet from the council table to actually develop that program. We've been asked, of course, from the last work session with the BOCC, it was take a look at it. What would it look like as a coordinated program? But you have a fundamental issue of not being able to do site source separation to the level that the county is currently doing in its program, and the overarching, overarching desire was to mirror that program. And so that, that's where it's not just a, it, there's a lot of logistics and, and, and spatial issues, particularly for our core, yeah. with that, the, with um, following suit with the county in that area. And that is a, a heavy level of coordination. So I just bring that up yeah, as no, in terms it's of great. capacity of this leadership group. And, and just for council's clarification, we did implement um, a, a program that I think mirrors to some degree some of the thresholds that the county has. We've implemented the Green Halo projects, but specifically to the single family and duplex projects that have uh, pursued a demolition allotment. And I think the question is, are those kinds of programmatic elements something that council desires to be applied to development uh, uh, across our context? Yeah. Right now it's a very targeted approach to see how it works, to kind of roll out the program. Um, but beyond that, it is not, I, I think. No, that's exactly right. Yeah. So I, I think that I think that that's the kind of distinction that I think um, Sarah's making right now is that, you know, if we were to go beyond sort of what we've implemented around single family and duplex, it would be a, um, a so big deal for, for particularly for our, our so action environmental health. Our, our demolition and waste requirements uh, are primarily focus currently on single family residential demolition or duplex. That's correct. And what you're saying is that we're not covering remodels and we're not covering commercial demolition in our current codes. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I would say, yes, I'd like to add that to the list. And as I kind of started my comments, I would like to add capacity to your department so that um, these things can be handled in a timely fashion. Um, I, I just don't see it really slowing down, <laughs> period, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in our community. So uh, I would like to find a way in which we could do that. The only other thing that, for me, I think I've really wanted to see what we could track down, and it's something that falls somewhere between ComDev and somewhere between APSHA and somewhere else. I'm not sure which, but I w would love to try to get a better handle on how many jobs we have within Pickin County in our community and versus how many deed restricted housing units we have. And it just, it, it, it's, uh, I know there's some assets and Sarah has forwarded me some links to Bureau of Labor Statistics, but I, I'm not the one who can figure those out. And we do have a policy analyst with APSHA now, um, which is going great, you know, and she's really uh, done a lot to really dig into the, the uh, empty bedroom syndrome. And, you know, there's something I, I need to point out is that as much as we try right-sizing and getting families with too many kids into a bigger unit, bigger people down, third bedrooms were never designed to hold workers per se. They were designed for families and for, um, you know, children and to keep a worker here as they hit the arc of their life and mature and decide not to leave when they're 29. But, we, we you know, it, it gets very hard to respond um, from the APSHA side uh, to what what is our goal? So, you know, it's no longer 60%. Is it is it what what is it? And and how do we explain the the affordable housing crisis a, as it exists? We know what's happened to the free market, but people are putting more and more demands on what could or should or may be happening within APSHA units. And I, I think that whether it's a policy analyst with APCHO or your department or conjunction, um, th that, that's baseline information we need to start really working on. That's just my, my thing. Uh, agree. 
turn the right. microphone All off on that one. All three of them gave me the look <laughs> at the same time that I'm supposed to take this, this one. Uh, we'll take a look at that within the scope of the um, demographic study, uh, where that fits in in phase one versus perhaps phase two. Um, yeah, the, and if the rest of the council's interested in, in the information, we've pulled what we can from the state demographer and the Census Bureau about what are the house, number of households uh, in the community. Uh, it doesn't tell us a whole, we haven't gone through the analysis of a whole lot more about what it tells us about the composition of those households uh, or their housing status. Uh, uh, we've really been keeping the uh, policy analyst first focused on the information needs of the APSHA board and as capacity allows, we have this on the project list for her, but uh, we can take a look at moving that small piece forward if the majority of the council well, has that, that similar interest. Um, I just want to go back to the construction and demolition piece, though, because that uh, is still hanging out there for me a little bit, and, and is there a majority of you that are seeing that as a majority part of the 2023 work plan to to revise and, and require more to some kind of policy discussion for for increasing diversion from commercial construction and general general residential construction here, essentially by the end of this year, or early next year. That, that's a pretty important direction we need to understand in terms of the Climate Action Sustainability Office's work plan. Because it has exploratory work in it, it's more that incremental approach is what we have in the work plan now, not a full policy change. Thanks for that. Ward, and then Rachel. Yeah, I, Rachel has mentioned a number of times capacity, and I don't know how um, adding that to to your scope of work for 2023 affects your ability to address the other issues that we've just gone over in depth. Um, I think that we, at the BOCC uh, meeting, the idea of maybe having some county land available for sorting, but they definitely said not at the landfill because of liability issues. But I'd like to start the initial conversation with the county about uh, how we can do that. We also heard that there's a possibility that the the um, life of the landfill could be greatly increased, that we're not under as much pressure as we thought uh, perhaps uh, was the case. So I, I, I just don't know if adding that on as an active piece is going to um, derail or delay and to what extent the issues that we've already discussed. And there's a degree to which we can use how outside consultants to add some temporary capacity on specific issues. There's always the opportunity for us to add staff, be it to the Environmental Health and Sustainability Department or to the Community Development side of the house. Um, but the fact remains that, as I think Sarah said very, very well, the construction demolition project is a significant undertaking and would require coordination with engineering because they manage the construction mitigation program for a construction sites, so how they how a construction site's managed. That would require coordination with engineering. Obviously, significant coordination required with um, the county and the landfill managers on how our, our regulations will ultimately interface there. And so there's a degree to which that would require planning support, particularly planning staff support to help with that. And so if we wanted to add construction and demolition um, diversion to the list, I think at that point we'd have to start talking seriously about adding staff to the, to the um, department. Yeah, it's easy as for us to sit here and say go ahead and add the staff, but when it comes to adding the staff, it's a, it's a more difficult um, act than just saying do it. I think it's very well put, and, and it's exactly right. If we went and tried to hire a skilled, experienced planner who could engage in policy work tomorrow, they might be able to actually start working on this issue in four months three months. It's a very challenging labor market right now. We've been down as many as three people on the planning side for almost a year, and our ability to fill those positions, particularly skilled mid-level positions, is really constrained by the labor market right now. And so I can tell you that we can put our best foot forward in terms of adding that capacity to the department, but the reality is I can't give you a guarantee about how that would translate into timelines for adding anything to this to this list. Yeah, I, w I would support putting this on initial um, uh, scoping, but not a major uh, uh, addition to the scope of work that you've outlined for 2023. What I'd suggest is we get through then, you're going to review the organics diversions ordinance here this quarter still. Um, and we, we, uh, we are bringing you a game plan for full implementation of that. We actually think it's an 18 month to two year implementation 
of the level of organics diversion that has come from council's conversation. So getting that up and going would, would be, I think, a good start for that staff team, and we can have then a, a check-in about capacity to, to, to run that program in addition to taking on the CND. I'm just thinking through. It's a good suggestion. What, what we know about the timing of that. So um, the organics diversion has been a great partnership with the county, uh, the work going into it. Uh, and the next big step is really helping support those commercial enterprises that t don't do this already, that are gonna need a lot of support to get there. Thanks. Um, <clears throat> so then the way that Ward described the sequencing, put it on a scoping, Sarah's suggesting that it, it works in in sequence. I didn't expect to see anything on this until third quarter at the most. It also, for me, works together with um, the demo permitting in what I described earlier. So I, I'm comfortable it moving forward kind of as Ward described it. As you have said, hey, we've got some front end work that we can do on it now, but we don't expect to see it for a while. I'm, I'm comfortable with that. I appreciate you bringing that up and reinforcing yeah. it. Uh, I do think it is somewhere we want to get. Um, but with respect to, again, as Ward was saying, the capacity, and um, I don't want to add it if it's going to interrupt the flow of what we've talked about here tonight, but I do think it is in our future. I think that's helpful. That's actually great to know because then yes. we're working uh, pretty far ahead on that team's work plan as what's their top priority. They would appreciate that direction. And well ahead of budget so that yeah. they can make appropriate requests for it. Thanks for that. Uh, did you want a couple comments, John? Yeah, I, I think the C&D stuff is really important, um, but I would agree with Ward with what we learned at the BOCC joint meeting about the lifetime of the landfill it's, and our current staffing woes. Um, I will go along with Sarah's recommendation to sequence this after our composting food waste diversion stuff gets up and running. Thank you. Thanks, John. Rachel? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can understand the, the challenges and the capacity, so I'll, I'll uh, acquiesce in that sense. I, I do think that to the extent that this is something that could be contracted out to take a look at or do more of the background work uh, with any firms in town, that would make sense. I, you know, it'd be great if the county does get that permit. It, they won't know if they're going to get that permit or if we're still on a seven-year deadline or not for a very long time. Uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot of um, state uh, oversight to landfills and things like that. So we won't really know if it's extended or not for a while. But I still think is a point at which we want to uh, upcycle, recycle, reuse whatever waste we can from these demolitions. And uh, if we get there over time, that's fine. But uh, it seems at some level it might be work that could be done um, at some level, some of the background work uh, with consultants. And, Thanks for that. And, yeah. and just for Council's further consideration as, as you folks are thinking about this sort of ongoing, I do think as a, as a consequence of the demolition projects, you know, one of the intentions for those requirements that went along for the redevelopment of those projects was to kind of experiment and see how things worked. And we knew, we understand very clearly the challenges on, you know, a single family lot and doing, you know, on-site diversion and, and sorting. But we think that those projects are gonna be good experiments to see what works and what doesn't. And, um, you know, by the time, you know, we maybe have this conversation again with council um, later in the year, we might have some, some good data um, from how they submitted their construction management plans um, with their building permits for some of these projects. So. We should have some more information about how this might work on the ground sort of across projects. Thank you. Um, just last comments for me. First of all, I want to thank you guys so much. Um, we put a lot on you over the last year, two years, um, and, what ha and, and everybody's had a lot put on them over the last three or four years. So I just want to start by saying thank you. Um, <clears throat> I also really appreciate you coming forward tonight with this work session. Um, you heard council talking around different topics. You identified last year that you were gonna need some clarity moving forward and prioritizing. And so I really appreciate you just picking up that ball and running with it and coming back to us at this time. Um, you know, on my list as we've been talking and 
getting ready for this meeting about our work plan prioritization. Uh, as I went through, I was really appreciative of the work plan that you have scheduled out. Um, for me, I had three check marks, uh, overall permit process improvements, uh, EHS integration, and the demo permit and diversion, I put those in the same one. Those are the only three that I had check marks behind. And the reason for that is because, as I've shared with Sarah a lot, is you know from the work that you guys have done over the last 12 months or two years, um, I really see right now as a time for us to let things settle, keep working on what we know we need to work on. Obviously, uh, you know the STR program that's just gotten up and running, you've got to keep tabs on it and stay alert, see what's coming up from it. Um, the permit process ongoing that you're doing, fantastic. Um, so more than anything, I just hope that you guys have a workload that is uh, doable. Um, I, I know that you guys put in a ton of extra hours, a ton of extra blood and sweat as well over the last couple of years. So for me, I really want you to take this opportunity to refine what we've been working on, uh, but make sure that, that you're taking on a workload that is doable for yourselves because you've really gone up above and beyond. So I want to say thank you and I appreciate your ongoing hard work. Well, I really appreciate those comments, Mayor Tori, and, and I, I work really closely with Ben and Bonnie and CJ and Amy Simon to make sure that our staff feel supported and seen, and I really appreciate you saying that here this evening. And uh, yes, we do work really hard on a lot of different things in community development every day. And yes, we have a culture of continuous improvement where we always want to be looking in the mirror, making sure that we're doing our business as best as we possibly can. And uh, we are in charge of some very complex, very important matters. And we take that responsibility very seriously every day. And then the last two is just keep doing what you're doing. Make sure you're in contact with these people that work in this industry all the time. Take their input as much as you can. Give them the avenue to, to put their input in as much as you can. Uh, and then the other, only other thing is, uh, you know, let's keep it public facing as well. The, the, the public need of the work that we're doing because they don't always know it. So, Thank you. All right, thank you guys so much. Thanks. All right. Thank you to Grassroots. We are back tomorrow at 5 p.m. with a regularly scheduled meeting, which means we take public comment at 5 p.m. If there's members of the public that wish to show up, please join us tomorrow at 5. Thank you. Bye for now. Break. Give a minute.